Welcome, and thanks for joining me for Pathfinder Kingmaker. We're in the tavern. We've got our nice new rug here with the, the giant owlbear. We're going to talk to Amiri about her quest. And we may go ahead and uh, help her. Or, uh, or in addition to that, maybe uh, work on some of the errands that we have to take care of. So let's start off with Amiri and see what she has to say. And then we'll get going. The barbarian sips the beer from her mug with a grim look. She hesitates as if she doesn't know where to begin. Once I told you about my tribe, remember? The six bears, of course I remember. Me, I'd be happy to forget, but they were spotted on your lands. Our scouts told they saw their camp near the Numeria border. Six bears camp has been revealed. What are they doing here? You're asking me? I don't have no idea. I really hoped I'd never see these ugly faces again. I walked across Numeria to be as far from them as I could, and now they follow me. What the hell? So let's visit my old tribe, find out what, what do they want so far from their snow, and then we can kick them back. She finishes her beer in one gulp, then belches and stumbles towards the tavern maid to order another. Okay, visit the campsite of the Six Bears tribe with Amiri, I'm assuming. Okay. Well, we may do that. First, I want to uh, talk to Lindsay about potentially helping out. Let's see, we have we also have Jubilost. We need to find an author that would help Sh Shinia. Let's start by finding Lindsay. I believe she's probably back in our throne room, isn't she? Okay, yeah, Lindsay's right here. Let's see if she can possibly help out with that. How's your publishing house? In full swing, the press is working day and night. Turns out there aren't just readers, but also writers in our lands. They keep bringing me new manuscripts. Some are even readable without crying. Okay. Uh, she does not seem to be interested in that. Oh, Tessie the, Tessie the Quill is the other writer we could talk to. All right. Um, is Jubilast in here? I don't think so, since he's not an advisor. Okay, we're gonna go find maybe, uh, might talk to Tessie first. Okay, here's Tessie the Quill. Let's talk to her. Good day, your Ines. All right, well, tell me about yourself. I guess we haven't talked to her yet. Nothing to tell, native of nowhere. Live on the road, pedal books. No family, no home, no cares, no troubles. How did you meet Lindsay? Went through her village from time to time. Weren't many buyers. I was lucky to sell half a dozen calendars each year. Maybe a couple cheap vulgar prints. Then a priest from the capital went to live there and he got the young people interested in reading little by little. Some would ask for romance stories. Some wanted heroic tales. Well, one day this little tot came by and traded her father's belt, two bottles, and a hunk of bread or a two-volume collection of legends about the Arch Knights of Avistan. Came back later all tear-stained, looking like her daddy didn't need the belt after all. So she sniffles at me and says, Take me with you. I can help. And looks at me like a lost puppy. So I took her along. Why not? And that's what got the ball rolling. Decided to stay with us? For now, for now, Lindsay wants my help selling the books she's printing. Trade's good, so I'll stick around and be an eyesore for a while. When I'm tired of it, I'll be on my way. Okay. Let's see what you've got to sell. I I don't think we've gotten the quest yet. Is it from Bakken for the three books? We've got part one and part two. Maybe we should see if she happens to have part three and then we'd be set with that whenever. Yeah, I don't think so. Okay. All right. She is not apparently interested in writing for Shinea. Is Jubilast out here somewhere? Oh, where? Oh, he's right there. Okay. Should be right over here. Yeah, I don't know what he's doing here. Like, hiding behind these haystacks or just trash. Jubilast raises his head and closes his notebook. Ah, it's you. How can I help? 
I guess we haven't visited with him. All right. What are you jotting down in your notebook all the time? Notes on our adventures. Good ideas that come to mind. I don't know how it is with you, but in my case, my mind is constantly producing thoughts and ideas worthy of writing down. Some I use in my articles and books. Others I share with the audience next time I speak at Foray Logos in Absalom. Some other thoughts should be kept out of the public view for a while. Our world isn't yet ready for certain revelations. Tell me about yourself. I've heard this request so many times. Well, as we are traveling together, I suppose I can give you an interview, free of charge, of course. Where are you from? All of Galarian is my home. I am a citizen of the world. Some might say my home is Absalom, that great old patchwork city. It's there that my books and magazine articles are published, and there I am held in particularly high esteem, owing to my vast knowledge. In fact, once I was invited to the College of Mysteries itself, but I prefer to think of Absalom not as home, but headquarters, where I go to plan my next adventure. I've visited every country worth mentioning in Avistan and Garand. I've even trodden the exotic lands of Jean T. Tian Ji. I've seen miracles and couldn't even ma imagine. And in every place I've been, there was a home that would have gladly received a renowned explorer such as myself. The famous name of Jubilast Narthropel is known even in the most remote corner corners of the world. Still, where were you born? You know, the line between persistence and importunity is very thin. And you risk crossing that line. Jubilast sighs. Do you think I haven't mentioned my birthplace because of my forgetfulness? I was born in Taldor, if you must know. The Empire is in decline nowadays, but still cherishes the illusion of its past glory. It's a country torn by prejudice. In Taldor, my mind was trapped in a cage of restrictions, birthright, poverty, and their beggars be damned attitude. I left the country as soon as I understood it. So, if you ever need... If you ever try to rekindle any patriotic feelings in me, you'll be disappointed. My first article in The Independence was about Taldor. The magazine was almost closed as a result of the scandal that followed, and it would have closed were it not for crowds of my supporters marching in protest under the windows of the publishing house, making its editors change their minds. You've traveled so much. Tell me of your travels abroad. Jubilast tilts his head, peering at you. I've written a fair number of articles and essays on my journeys, and if you'll excuse me, I haven't the slightest desire to retell them all to you right now. If you wish to learn about foreign lands, pick up any issue of the Independence and read all you like. I'm sure you can find magazines even in this hole of a place. So you write books and magazine articles? I certainly do. I'm too generous not to share my thoughts and journeys with other minds who search for knowledge. Judging from your face, you don't belong in that category. Among my scientific works, I'd recommend the range of articles published in National Alchemy. If you prefer lighter reading, you might like Traveler's Essays or the scandalous The Independence. If pictures capture your attention better than words, page through the illustrated Atlas of Avistan. And you should give your cook a volume or two of my culinary almanacs. Trust me, it might help. Jubilast throws a speculative glance at you. Some have tried to blame me for a sleazy romance novel called The Five Sins of Saren Ray. I have no idea on who spread these crazy rumors, but if you like such frivolity, I've been informed that the novel's sequel, The Sixth Sin, was recently published. You wear glasses. Why won't you ask some cleric to heal your eyesight? Jubilast throws a cutting glance at you. I'm sure you could have figured out the answer to that question on your own, if you bothered to use a logical approach. At least I sincerely hope so. I prefer to think of you as a lazy person, not a stupid one. <laughs> well then, I suppose it's my fate to enlighten you. Alright, there's no time like the present. Let's build up to a logical conclusion together. So, starting with the obvious, a cleric services cost several hundred gold coins. Spectacles cost a dozen gold coins. So maybe I just couldn't afford to pay the cleric. Incorrect conclusion. I earn enough, besides some clerics would surely help me free of charge, because they're fans of my incomparable talent. The answer couldn't be the money then, so what is it? 
Let's explore further. Surely you've noticed that I'm a rather famous person. <laughs> if I hadn't noticed by now, I've heard it a number of times. Just to be clear which circles I'm famous in, my scientific articles are well known among the students and teachers of various institutions of higher education. My articles that satirize the rich and powerful are extremely popular among the minor, minor nobility, traders, and workers. That is, among anyone who doesn't have any power for themselves. The kind of people who don't usually have enough money to afford an expensive cleric. Well, can you add it all up and find the right answer yet? Jubilas doesn't let you get a single word in edgewise. Apparently, he's uninterested in your reaction and is just enjoying listening to his own voice. My spectacles are something that unites me with my readers. People are more open to those who share their social status. Many of my readers can't afford to heal their eyesight at the temple. So when I, too, refuse such healing, I become closer to the people. My spectacles are part of my image. Yeah, you're just a real man of the people, aren't you? Jubilast exhales at last. I believe I've managed to explain the basics of logical thinking. No need to thank me. All right. Tell me something about the history of the gnome race. What have I come to? Jubilast Narthropal, famous explorer, writer, and scientist, is reduced to giving simple lessons in history. Very well, ask away. What questions do you have? How did gnomes appear in Galarian? They came here in ancient times from the first world. You do know what the first world is, right? If you don't, ask me about it some other time. I used to lecture on it at a couple of institutes. According to the understanding I have accumulated, the gnomes were an immortal race until some of our especially insightful ancestors came up with a brilliant idea. They decided it would be fun to learn how it feels to be mortal. I would like very much to meet those gnomes. I wouldn't even kick them. I'd just look in their eyes without a single word. Too bad they're all long dead by now. As everyone knows, a stupid enough idea can be extremely contagious. So the gnomes caught this infection, all of them, without a hope for a cure. So they found a way to Galarian and decided to settle here. And you'll never believe it. They got just what they wanted. They severed their link with the first world. They gained mortality, the bleaching, and a heap of local diseases that have been keeping our race on the verge of extinction ever since. Do gnomes live long? Certainly. Long and happily ever after. Jubilast shakes his head in remorse. We live as long as elves were it not for the bleaching. That's the curse of our race, which only struck after the gnomes left the first world. To put it simply, gnomes must constantly have new experiences. If a gnome gets into a rut, so to speak, he bleaches. We start to lose color, literally. Our skin and hair become pale, and the worst thing is that our soul loses color, too. If the process continues unchecked, the gnome dies. History recalls only a few cases where gnomes actually died of old age. Most of them perish either because of the bleaching or in the middle of some crazy adventure they've joined just to stave it off. So you travel as much, you travel so much as a way to fend off the bleaching. Jubilast stares at you, then nods slowly. You see, I enjoy being alive. I like to eat pancakes in the morning. I like to write articles for magazines. I like it when I leave the publishing house in Absalom and a crowd of fans immediately mobs me. So I don't intend to die at the peak of my life because of some stupid ancient curse. But don't you dare imagine that everything I do is just for fear of the bleaching. I tell people the truth about the world that surrounds them. My theoretical research aids the development of different branches of science in various institutes. Yes, sooner or later I'll bleach and die, like any other gnome, but the name of the famous Jubilast Narthropal will live throughout the ages. Okay, I'd like to learn more about the first world. Well, you've asked the right person. I am an expert in studying the first world. Give me your questions. What's it like? It's huge, wild, and extremely unfriendly to the unprepared traveler. Nothing remains constant there. Matter changes before your eyes. What was a mountain yesterday becomes a river today. And that river flows upwards. The trees touch the sky. The heat of the desert can melt metal. And hurricane winds can tear a person apart. But it would be wrong to think of the first world as the plane of total destruction. 
creation is just as important there. The deserts spring alive into forests, and when the hurricane subsides, animals emerge from hiding. Huge, wild, as untamed as the world itself. The first world epitomizes life in its original chaotic meaning. There's a theory that gods used the first world as a training ground to practice their ability to create matter. They abandoned the first world to its own fate and wandered off to create Galarian. Some say that the inhabitants of the first world still hold a grudge against the gods for this. How can a person get there? Mainly through magic portals created by skilled magicians, but the price of such a portal is usually in excess of several thousand gold coins. There is another way, of course. There are documented cases where spontaneous portals to the first world have opened in remote places on Galarian, where, as mages say, the boundaries between the two worlds have grown thin. Yeah, we've found some of those portals, but spontaneous portals are rather dangerous. You never know what's lurking on the other side. Only desperate adventurers and madmen use them, and of course, romantic suicidal idiots who think that good common sense is too boring. Are there any sentient beings in the first world? Of course, the Fae, and all their relatives, and all their relatives' relatives, and then some more Fae besides. Sometimes one meets leprechauns or satyrs there, which are usually another type of Fae, just called by another name. And all of them are immortal, by the way, at least within their own homeworld. The souls of the creatures of the first world have no connection with the realm of mortals. When a creature of the first world dies, its soul just materializes in another body, similar to its old one. It's not a pleasant experience, and the resurrected creature loses almost all of the powers and abilities it developed over its life, but keeps all its memories and personality. It's still much better than a mortal death, I would say. Sometimes the process doesn't even take long. A killer might meet his victim again the following week. Naturally, this immortality has influenced the way first world inhabitants think. For instance, Fae enjoy mischief and tricks that can easily end in someone's death. The Fae think it's just funny. And anyone from another world who falls victim to such tricks doesn't end up having much to say at all. Once, the gnomes were immortal relatives of the Fae. Who rules the first world? It's commonly, commonly assumed that the eldest rule it. They are overseers, but more just a glorified version of fey lords. Power attracts pompous blockheads in every world. Uh, I do what I have the right to do. Jubilast stares at you with interest. Yes, I've met plenty of pompous blockheads who believed they had the right to do whatever hideous thing came to mind. So if you decide to join their ranks, know that you're not the first to walk that path. But let's get back to the first world. The eldest possessed the power to keep matter in the first world in a more or less constant state. That's why the Fae treat them as demigods and offer them prayers just as we offer prayers to Desna, Aristil, or even Lamashtu. Okay. Well, you must know a lot about the first world. Oh, yeah, we already went through that. Um, I read your article about the barony. Should I be flattered? Flattery is entirely foreign to my works. Everything that I write is the absolute truth. And never intended to satisfy egos. Jubilast looks at you over his glasses. But in case you were wondering, yes, I'm impressed with what you've done. But you're not very friendly, you know. Do you think so? Jubilast looks at you above his glasses. Why ever not, if I may ask? Perhaps you confuse superficially friendly words with genuinely friendly intentions. Believe it or not, I wish you only well. As a proof of that, I can point to the fact that I travel with you and that I'm talking with you right here and now. Tell me, which do you value more? An artificial smile or an honest attitude bolstered by friendly advice and assistance? Um, very well. You can behave as you like. I thank you for this permission. Can I have it in writing in case you forget someday? All right. Okay, I guess he's not interested in helping out somebody as a writer either. So I'm not sure. Author wanted. 
looking for a skilled author who could pen a book about her amazing adventures. So we must need to find we need to find an author who's looking for a job. I don't think we've run across them yet. Okay. So I think what we're gonna do is grab Amiri and head out and on the way to her the camp, we're gonna take care of stopping to visit some of these artisans in the Camelands and the North Gnarl Marches. We've still we've got a couple other here things. But I think we'll I'll focus on these two and then head to help Amiri. Okay, we're about to enter Shambling Steps over here in the Came Lands. This is our new settlement here. We should have an artisan here to visit, I believe. We also grabbed Amiri and leveled her up once. Uh, she's only like level five barbarian, but uh, hopefully that will be sufficient for what we need to do. We do have the Beric the Wild Fist. Okay, we should talk to them. There's a trader, Nazriel. I think that's the artisan. Okay. Let's talk to this guy, Verask the Wild Fist. An elderly half orc looks at you without any friendliness. His clothes are covered with spots and he looks exhausted and sickly. What are you looking at? Can't you see Master Verask is not well? On my last legs. Go along, leave me to my unhappy fate. Despite the cantankerous tone, there is certain confidence in the half-orc's voice, especially in how proudly he spoke the word master. Uh, what's your name? Verask. Verask the Wild Fist, they call me. I was once an armor and weapons maker. I'm more of a corpse than a master now. Some evil people took everything from me. My family, my house, my craft. Even took my tools, everything. What happened? What happened? It was a calamity. I was going about my business and then I fell ill, cut down by a fever. I'd been burning up for three weeks. I thought I would die more than once. A local merchant saved me, a kind soul, damn him. He saved me, but not for free. Took everything I had as payment, even my precious work tools, the last of my treasures. I'm useless like this. What good am I to anyone? But if I got my tools back, I'd be quite all right. I used to make such weapons and armor. They sold faster than I could make them. But without my tools, I'm useless. If you tried to use a regular hammer to forge like I do, you'd just ruin a good thing. I'd bend the, t bend the tongs and wouldn't make anything worth putting my name to. That trickster got everything I need. The half-orc pierces you with his angry eyes. Listen, I can tell you got money. Maybe you need an armorer. If you help me, I'll serve you. I'll make formidable weapons for you, ones that just beg for enemy blood. But first, I need my tools back. Okay. Well, I guess we'll keep an eye out for them. The half-orc harumps brashly in response, but his eyes seem disappointed. The, our only other option there was to kill him, so... Okay, he was one of the artisans we needed to visit. The weapons tools must be purchased from the vendor and returned to Verask. Okay. Well, let's see. There's a trader right here. Verask tools. Okay. I think we're okay on camping supplies, but let me check. Yeah, we've got 12. All right. Okay. Here you go. The half-orc touches the tools tenderly as if he can't believe his eyes, and then clutches them as tightly as he can. Can I have them back, really? Thank you so much. Well, now I'll be all right. I'll have food on the table, I'll get rid of this damn fever and do what I promised my children. And I'll keep my promise. Give me a place to set up a shop and I'll work hard to repay you. Okay. We probably need to build his building now. And I leveled up here. As long as we're not occupied, I will take care of that. 
Okay, we got Anna leveled up. Um, these, uh, I forget what they were called. Let's see if I can see that here. Are these uh, weapon training feats that she gets are kind of cool. We took this armed bravery. She applies her bonus from bravery, which uh, was here. The plus one to will saves against fear. She applies that bonus to all her will saving throws. I don't know. It seemed kind of cool. And then she gets the, some of those again at later levels. Anyway, she is leveled up. So let's talk to this person up here. Nazriel. Oh, is this the writer? Okay. Let's talk to her. But now that I, I kind of remember this now. A stunning elven lady turns to you. Her hair is immaculate and her eyes are deep water. Her beauty is like a bird of prey. She is also heavily armed. As she sees you, her superior air fades, leaving a charming smile on her face. How fortunate, your grace. Allow me to introduce myself. I am Nazriel the weaponsmith. Okay, no, she's not a writer. She's a weaponsmith. Smith. I can craft the deadliest weapons mortals can make. I'd like to take the opportunity to pay my respects. As soon as I found out you were here, I dispatched one of my apprentices, but of course the bonehead failed his mission. Would you like to hear an offer that would be to our mutual benefit? What do you have to offer? I hope to start serving you in exchange for your protection. You see, my creations are not to everyone's liking. In the lands where I come from, demand for artful blades is low. The heavier and cheaper ones are better for peasants. I had to swallow my pride and do such work merely to survive. I, no I know that serving you will allow me to earn true recognition. I'm offering you a contract. You will provide me a workplace and all the necessary re resources, and I shall fill your arsenal with perfect instruments of death. More, I will craft for you personally an amazing and deadly weapon, for which there is no equal. I have long been looking for a warrior worthy of this masterpiece. Sounds good to me. All you need to do is sign the contract and place your first order. Do we have a deal? Um, tell me who you are first. An artist, one of a kind. I create weapons, not just pointy iron sticks, but real weapons. Nazriel raises her eyebrows meaningfully. Alas, not every domain appreciates high quality and expensive blades. I hope you'll be a generous patron and an appreciative connoisseur. All right, we'll make a deal. Nazriel's eyes shine with excitement. She hands you a pen and paper. Thank you. Sign here, please, and here, done. All right, no one can touch a court blacksmith. I will order my apprentices to pack up my materials and take them to the new workshop, which you will kindly provide me with. As soon as I'm settled, I'll send one of my people to deliver your order. Okay, sounds good. Anyone else here? There's a priest there, but I don't think we need them at the moment. Um, okay, we've met everyone at the Kama lands. So we need we need to go to the north Gnarl marches still and meet some people up there. So we'll head there and see let's look over here real quick first the citizens okay all right i'll see you in the north narrow marches okay we're in tatzelford looks like we have sherelle over here and chemo tavon up there the young half elf looks up at you exhausted somebody has recently given him a black eye there's panic in his voice. I beg you, help me. I haven't done anything wrong. What's going on here? Greetings, your grace. I apologize for the noise. Our captain thought it would be good to make an example of this criminal. Keep the public in line, you know. This one turned out to be a little noisy. The half-elf looks shocked and terrified by his circumstance. You're the local ruler, aren't you? I beg you for your mercy. I've been arrested as a thief and I'm about to go to jail. But haven't done anything wrong. I've never taken anything that wasn't mine. Someone slandered me for stealing property from a merchant in the capital. We had a deal. He promised to lend me money for a new workshop. But I didn't take a single coin. It's all a lie. I beg you, please. Nobody believes me. The merchant's name is Hasef. He would help me if only he knew I was in trouble. Please talk to the merchant in the capital. He will confirm I'm in innocent. What's this half-elf charged with? 
theft, your grace. We chased him all the way out here from the capital, stole something from a merchant, and escaped. Just another scoundrel, your grace. Never mind him. They're all the same. He was found out, so now he's yelling about being innocent. Okay, well, we'll we'll go check on it. We'll talk to Hasef. We know him. Without a doubt. And then let's talk to Kimo. Tavon. Before you is a tall, pale elf, the soft features of his face sharply contrasting his angular figure, but his woeful gaze is fixed on the ground. He finally notices you and, startled, blinks at you absentmindedly. He talks slowly, slightly elongating his words as he speaks. Good day. Who are you? Kimo. Kimo Tavon. An odd name for an elf. The elf shrugs. My parents named me Kim Kimiel. But my friends decided this name didn't suit me so well. What are you doing here? The elf blushes ever so slightly and lowers his gaze. I can't tell you. It's a secret. Although, if you promise, the elf looks at you with hope in his eyes. If you promise to help me, then I will tell you. What sort of help do you need? That is a secret. After some hesitation, the elf decides to add, But it's not hard. Not at all. You have my word. And what do I get if I help you? Hmm, in that case, I, I will give you my spear. I can make a lot of handy things out of wood. You could call me a woodworker in your tongue. I can't agree to anything before I know what exactly you need. The elf wrinkles his forehead in concentration. Well, if you insist. Nunuk, the hunter, told me that he saw an incredibly beautiful flower growing in the swamp. I would go and pick it myself, but I fear I would become lost. Also, there are monsters there. So, will you help me? Very well. Perfect. Come back as soon as you can. Alright. Okay. So we need to find a flower in the swamp. Anybody else here? Priest. Let's just walk around up here real quick. Make sure we're not missing anybody. Anything of interest? You have a trader. But I think we're good for now. Let's just rest real quick while we're here. Okay. Let's head back out to the map. So we could go look for that flower. I think it's nearby. Or, we're also now, I think, in the neighborhood of the Barbarian Camp. Six Bears Camp. Yep, it's right up here. Um, yeah, I don't think we have a location marked for that flower. So I don't know exactly, unless it's like... Oh, it's down here at the Swamp Witch. Okay. Yeah, so since we're up here, we're going to head maybe up just up the river here to the Six Bears Camp. Since we have a Mary with us. Let's see. Uh, probably should have gone this way. There we go. And here we are. Okay. Got some barbarians here. Barbari barbarian. Save yourselves. It's them again. We got action over here. Damn ghost send us monsters again. Nightmare skeleton soldier. I'll carve my name into your flesh. I'm thinking we could probably just run in here. We need to prolong this. We can handle some skeletons. Come on, everybody. Get in here. Kane, the only one doing anything? Where are people? Leopard. 
Oh, okay. I guess everybody was just kind of holding back. Leopard's the only one. Moving. Get up here. Leopard's doing his own thing down there. Let's go, let's go, people. I don't know why everybody's standing around. Like, it's like there's no AI or something. Amiri, get in there. There we go. That was kind of weird. Everybody was just sort of standing there, watching. As soon as you approach the camp, a bright-eyed girl in a long skirt runs up to Amiri and gives her a big hug. Amiri, you're really alive. Oh, the girl sobs and wipes her eyes. Everyone said you were killed by the giants, but I always believed you survived. And no one has ever found your body. Amiri, I missed you so much. There now, stop crying. I'm alive, alive and well. You know nothing can beat me. Here, meet meet each other. Nilak, this is Baron Kane. He is something like a new chieftain for me now. Kane, this is Nilak. She, she is the only decent person in my whole lousy tribe. Don't say that. Yes, the elders were mean to you, but you shouldn't blame the whole tribe. Having wiped her eyes, Nilak presses her hands against her chest and bows before you. I am Nilak, song keeper of the six bears. You must be the ruler of these lands. Forgive us for intruding into your domain, but we... Amiri, wait, really? Amiri interrupts her. You are really Songkeeper now? That's great. Since when? Nilak gives her a sad smile. I always wanted to be one. While you were learning to fight, I learned the legends. While you were training with the sword, I trained with the tambourine. But I was initiated during your funeral feast, Amiri. When we were saying goodbye to you and your party. As I sang at the funeral pyre, my heart broke in pain. Desna whispered to me and told me how I could turn this pain to power. Even the rocks and stones cried over the fallen when they heard my song that night. Nice to meet you, Nilak. May both our tribes live in peace. We... Okay, here's Chieftain Akaya. An old gray-haired barbarian with a tattooed face interrupts her. Nilak, who are you chatting with? Who are you? Wait... He looks closer at Amiri's face and suddenly starts to yell, pointing his crooked finger at her. You, pariah, freak, after all you did, you still have the nerve to come and show your ugly face here? Chieftain Akaya, this is Baron Kane. We're in his lands now. Please soften your heart. Maybe he can help us. Hmm, a baron? That's something like a chieftain, right? You don't look like one. Well, whatever. I am Akaya, chieftain of the Six Bears tribe, and I need you to give me this dirty scumbag. He points his finger at Amiri. Hmm. Sounds like you're not too clever. So I'll speak in a language I'm sure you understand. One more rude word and I'll punch your rotten teeth down your throat. You threaten the six bears, you foolish pup. Don't waste your breath. Thanks to her, we've witnessed horrors you can't imagine. Just let me tell you what she's done to us. From the dawn of time, our tribe lived by the old ways. Everyone had a place, a job to do. Men crafted and went hunting. Women bore children and kept the huts clean. These are the ways set by our ancestors, and we do not change it. But then this upstart girl wants to match herself against men. She passed the warrior's initiation. She went hunting. But there's truth in the saying, nothing good comes from a woman with a sword. Neighbor tribes laughed at us. Look, there's a second chieftain in the tribe. Soft chieftain, girl chieftain, must be the end of the six bears. And they were right. She brought disaster upon our whole tribe. Once a gang of giants came to our lands. They scared our prey, attacked our huntsmen, so we decided to deal with them. We sent a group, and she went along. For a long time we waited for this group to return, then we went searching for them even longer. But all we found were their dead bodies. Giants killed them all, everyone except for her. And then things got even worse. Have you seen those monsters? An evil spirit sends them, the ghost of a giant. He's the one who chased us from our lands. He chased us through all of Numeria. Even now he's somewhere nearby. Maybe he's just over that hill. He chases us, kills our people, and always says the same. Bring the thief to me. Find Amiri. The chieftain turns to Amiri, his face red with anger. He shouts, slobbering in her face. Now you understand? That's what your dreams have cost us. You brought a curse on our tribe, pariah. 
Now hand me your weapons and get yourself to the women's hut. That is your place. It always was and always will be. We'll feed you to the ghost and maybe then he'll leave us alone. And at least you'll atone for a tiny part of your guilt. Uh, I don't think so, buddy. <laughs> In reply, Amiri headbutts the chieftain's face, breaking his nose with a sickly crunch. Paying no heed to Nilak's squeal and gro growling in anger, she leaps upon him, punching the old man's face. The chieftain spits blood and struggles to speak, and Amiri grabs her sword. You realize that a murder will quickly follow. Uh, watch silently. Ouch. Amiri plunges her sword into the chieftain's chest. She breathes heavily, staring at the old man as he falls to his knees before her. Then he, she looks around the campsite, and all the barbarians who witnessed the scene, Nilak included, dash inside their huts. Panting heavily and swaying like a drunk, Amiri approaches you and puts her bloody hand on your shoulder. That old goat said, some evil spirit must be somewhere nearby. Let's go. We find him and we, we kill him. And then we make them all go back where they came, where are they from. I don't know, to them, nothing. And never. I don't want to see them, never again. Okay. Destroy the spirit that haunts the six bears. Oh, here we go. Okay. Yeah, I thought, there are many roads to success. thought that was just like incoming. He brought some friends too. Let's let's, see, let's hold off on getting Kane in there. This is kind of the first fighting we've done here since we've been back in the, the main game since the DLC. Let's get Alvar out front here. They're all going to just come out Kane. Okay. Yeah, let's see. Got to re remember what we've got here. Let's get... Uh, how about Inspire Greatness? Oh, if we've got the, the Storm Call, too. I forgot about that. Okay, we can use a Thunder Call, though. Maybe we could stun this thing. Didn't stun it. Okay. Oh, we got coming from behind. Bruin, um, let's see. Let's do a prayer. Maybe move him out of the way a little bit. And uh, I'd like to get her up there to, by Alvar. I guess we could let Kane maybe handle this skeleton down here. Let's get Anna up here. Next to her brother. Yeah, Kane, you can head this way then. I wonder if, if we can get... Oh, I didn't notice that one right there. Well, Leopard's on him. Get studied target on and still get an attack in here. You've made your choice. Yeah. She is just summoning summoning an army. I do kind of miss uh, we traded out our wizard for Amiri. We're gonna be lacking in some magic. It might really hurt us here. We do have the, the thunder call though from Amaya. Jeez, I don't remember it being this many of these guys. Amiri, let's get her rage on. They go down. She should be able to do some damage for us if she can stay alive. Okay. Out of my way. Got plenty of targets here to choose from. Leopard got he's surrounded here. These these skeletons don't seem to be too particularly tough. 
Okay, I think maybe instead of the greatness, we're going to get the storm call going. We're going to need that. And then... Um, we could try to glitter dust. I don't know. I think we just... Oh, she's got the haste. We need to get that going. Hopefully King can take care of these down here pretty quickly. Um, do these have an alignment? Neutral evil. So we could do protection from evil. Okay. Anna needs her mutagen. All right, Kane, take care of this guy. Maybe get a hit over here too. Yeah. Good. All right. Yeah, I don't think these things are gonna be too difficult. Ooh, but, but he hits hard. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we got the big guy vine trapped here from Bruin. So hopefully that will give us time to kill all these others before we focus on him. Okay, we're down to just the big guy and a couple skeletons left. I think we're safe to just real time this here, finish them off. Really hasn't been too tough of a fight, and we got the big guy vine trapped. So if Amiri might go down here, it looks like. Otherwise, we're gonna be fine. Okay, the big guy's down. Tell the tribe of your victory over the evil spirit. All right. We will do so. First, we're going to grab some loot. Ooh, great axe, banded mail, and some boots. Swift boots. Ooh. Those are going on Kane, I believe. Increase the wearer's movement speed by 10. Yes. Okay. This armor. Um. We need to get him a heavy armor proficiency, I think. Because we've actually we've got this band of mail plus three that could be a, maybe pretty nice on him. Anyway, what about this great axe? Frost great axe. I'm not sure we'll use that, um, but we'll think about that. That might be. For sale item. Okay, let's talk to Nilak. Amiri, that's it. We're done with your evil spirit. We cut him into pieces and cast them to the wind. Nilak, you, you didn't even try to speak with him. Amiri, we've already fought and killed him many times. It's no use. He always comes back. Oh, Amiri, why do you always slash first and think later? Oh. So what was I supposed to do? Lay on the ground for him? Let him eat me? Nilak, Amiri is right. There was no time to talk. Desna, why are you punishing me? Okay, Amiri is predictable, but what about you, Chieftain? You must realize every deal starts with negotiation. At least you could have tried. Nilak shakes her head in disappointment. Amiri, I hoped so much that after we found you, everything would be better. What should we do now? You don't like something? Come on, speak up. I can hear. Amiri bellows with unexpected anger. Nilak matches her anger. I'll tell you what I don't like. You left me. Thanks to you, I realized that a woman could do something bigger than scraping hides and cooking stew. I hoped you would become chief and I'd be your advisor, and together we'd change the ways of this tribe. But instead you just disappeared, even without even saying goodbye. I had nothing left but to become Akaya's advisor. Who led this tribe through the whole Numeria? Who do you think? Who negotiated with the other tribes? And who lived in the women's hut all this time, serving dinner to the chieftain? And now we found you. You. You ruin everything. Now the chieftain is dead. Who will be chief now? Will he even listen to me? Or will he be like you, letting his fist decide everything? Will this be the end of our tribe? Amiri had her reasons for doing what she did. I have no doubt about that, and she didn't think about anything else except her reasons. Congratulations, Amiri. Now you're just like a real man from the Six Bears. You only think about yourself. You use your fists whenever you need to or not. 
and then you leave it to the women to sort out your mess. So that's how you talk now, huh? You want me to tell you why I smashed this old mushroom's face and why I fled? I'll tell you. Listen now, you wanted it. The war party I went with, you think we went to fight the giants? I thought that too. I was so happy. I was a fool. We did not go there to kill giants, Nilak. We went there to kill me. They thought giants would eat me up and they wouldn't have to get their hands dirty. But I came back, alive, and with a sword. I thought no one would dare to say that Amiri wasn't a real fighter, but they just laughed into my face and said that if the giants didn't kill me, the frost would. Then they left me alone in the wilderness, without food or tent, and when I understood why, when I saw what this hunt was for, it was then, for the rest, the first in my life, I felt real rage. Yes, Nilak, don't you turn away now. Look in my eyes. I killed them all, with this sword. I'm not a thief, Nilak, I'm much worse. I'm a kinslayer. And you know what? I don't care. They deserved it. Our whole damned tribe can go to the dragon's maw. Nilak, and me too? What? Do I deserve to die? Should I go to the dragon's maw, too? No, you- this wasn't what I meant. You're not like them. I am part of this tribe, Amiri. If you don't want to help me save it, you'd better leave. I'll manage without you. I'll ask the Tiger Lords for help. Amiri spits on the ground and then grabs your hand in her iron grip and drags you away without saying another word. Alright. Now we finally know why Amiri doesn't like to talk about her past. Her tribesmen tried to get rid of her and fell, her, fell by her hand instead. But what's the connection between her and the ghost that haunts the tribe? And why does it call her a thief? What in the world could it want from her? At least for a while, these mysteries must remain unsolved. After an unsuccessful, more like catastrophic, family reunion, the Six Bears tribe returned to Demeria. But I have little doubt that we'll be hearing from them again and from that mysterious ghost, because if we don't, I'll just die of curiosity. Okay. So we picked up a couple of new errands and took care of the quest with Amiri. So next time uh, we may, may continue with the errands and probably need to check back home in Tuskdale and see if we've got any new stuff happening with Kingdom events. We, we do have just some map exploration we need to do as well. Um, and we've picked up some new regions, so we've, we need to probably make a trip around and claim all these resources. There's probably quite a few of those that we need to pick up. So we will take care of that probably next time. Thanks for being here. Thanks for watching. We need to drop Amiri off at home too. And uh, grab our wizard, um, Alora. So we've got our full regular party back with us really fun to uh, get back with them after playing the dlc for a while thanks for watching i really appreciate it and i hope to see you again bye bye